And I want to thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, October is LGBT History Month, which is perfect because tonight's speaker, Tom, is the founding member of the Seacoast LGBT History Project. I'm going to introduce him to you now. Tom Cockold founded the Seacoast New Hampshire LGBT History Project in 2015 to collect, preserve, and share the artifacts and stories of the LGBTQ community, a community he's been active in since the 1990s. Tom is a retired business systems analyst and resides in Portsmouth with, a, with his husband, Michael. He enjoys antiquing and spending time with his grandson. Tom. Thanks, Katie, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, the way I've organized tonight is in chronological order for most of the social and support groups. And then at the end, I'll talk about the clubs and bar scene. So we're going to start with, first of all, Katie said um, this month is, I got to make sure I can do this right. Or if I can't move this slide forward. Katie's going to help. Uh, <laughs> As Katie uh, said, um, October is LGBTQ History Month. And that was started in 1994 by a Missouri high school teacher. Um, they wanted a month dedicated to LGBTQ history because it wasn't being taught in schools. And they chose October because today, October 11th, is National Coming Out Day which was started in 1988. And it started in 1988 because it was one year anniversary of the March on Washington in 1987. So with a lot of these um, groups and events and things that happen, it's usually after some major event. And we'll see in our own history on the seacoast, when something happened, the seacoast responded, something else happened, the seacoast responded. So we'll see some of that tonight. The first group that we know about as a social group was the UNH Gay Student Organization, which was started in 1973. Um, so the Seacoast, we use the Wikipedia definition Seacoast, so it really includes a lot of towns that are we might not think of being on the Seacoast. So our first group was in Durham, and I put a little um, link. Um, there was a great article in the UNH magazine put out in 2010 about the gay student organization at UNH. It actually was one of the very early gay student organizations. And it was a result of the 1969 Stonewall riots in New York City. And the people that um, formed the group in 73 were, um, had to go to court. Um, the governor got wind that there was a gay student organization and he thought that there should be no state money going to these perverts. So he got this university to not allow the gay student organization to have any social events. So the gay student organization could meet, but they couldn't have any social events. And the, student, the students took the university to court. And in 1975, what actually went to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and the New Hampshire Supreme Court said, you have to allow the gay student organization to have social events. But that's one of the earliest um, uh, gay organizations on the seacoast. And if you go to other universities, like we went up to the University of Southern Maine because they have an awesome online LGBTQ archive, and they will talk about hearing about UNH being in the paper and what was going on with their GSO, and it kind of gave them the impetus to start their own, or they felt they could be more vocal with their own. So. It's um, interesting that that right here in Louisville, Durham, New Hampshire. Um, the next one that we know about was the Seacoast Area Gay Alliance. And it was actually some of the people from the gay student organization at UNH that moved to Portsmouth and <laughs> started the Seacoast Area Gay Alliance. Um, you can see that this is a, um, a listing of New Hampshire gay organizations from the 1975 newspaper, which I'll see it on the next slide. But um, 
they didn't do very much, they said. And it was really the seacoast of Maine and New Hampshire. So they had meetings here in Portsmouth, they had meetings in um, York, uh, and basically they had potlucks. And they, the one thing that one of the founders said that they did was go to a gunquet and go to a gay bar. And it was an older crowd there. So these were all students and they went in and they wanted to dance. And the old crowd was like, no, 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 you don't dance in this bar. No, it's interesting that that's about all they accomplished. Um, and they were only around until about 1978. Um, while I was looking up, trying to figure out when that Seacoast Area Gay Alliance started, because we actually found it searching through some of the archives at the University of Southern Maine, I came upon this one, Exeter New Hampshire's newly formed gay women's rap group. They had their first meeting on Tuesday, February 11th in 1975. And you can see here is the ad in the, it's the newspaper was the Gay Community News. It was out of Boston, the newspaper. And this was from February of 1975. That's really all I know about that group. I, I have no idea how long it lasted or what they actually did. The next group um, was started in 1979, Seacoast Gay Men. They started a meeting, it was an informal group initially, they were just meeting in somebody's office. They would have potlucks on Monday nights and they would just meet and sit around. And then in 1979, they decided to incorporate themselves and started meeting at South Church here in Portsmouth, Unitarian Church. And they met there for over 35 years. And then they moved recently, uh, five years ago, to the church in Kittery. What's interesting about this group is if you read the incorporation papers, they're incorporated as SGM. And it's a group of men with common interests that come together for fellowship. So the word gay is not used at all in their incorporation article, you know, their articles of incorporation. Um, they're still going on strong. This is from a Pride March in Boston. I believe it was in like 2000 or 2003. Um, the next group was uh, Gay AA, Gays Together in Sobriety. Actually, one thing I wanted to, to mention about um, Seacoast Gay Men. One of the things I wanted to try to mention for each group is kind of what do we have in our collection? What did the organization give us? What's going to be available to the public when we get everything cataloged and available online? Um, Seacoast Gay, Gay Men gave us their entire <laughs> archives. So there's new newsletters going back to 1979 all the way up to about 2010 when they stopped printing them and it was all done electronically. We have uh, pictures, we have all their financial records, all their audits that have ever been done on that organization since 1980. For Gay AA, Gay Together in Sobriety, this was a group that was founded in 1981. And it was just a few gay men thought it would be nice to have a separate AA meeting for gay folk. And again, they met at the Unitarian Church in Portsmouth. They started in 1981. And they were hugely successful. They had a lot of people attending. Um, they disbanded in 2019. So because our organization existed, they said, do you want all of our archives? And we said, sure. But being an anonymous group, <laughs> I think we have five pieces from their group. Um, and there's a couple of these banners that we have. We have three or four of these banners. We have their, um, I forget what it's called, um, their meeting format and their rules for meeting, and that's about it, because it's an anonymous group. So but we're very fortunate to get at least these things that we can share with everybody. Um, um, the AIDS pandemic, everyone knows, started in the 80s. Um, AIDS response C-Code started in 1987. It started as a buddy program, so where a person would be partnered with a person with AIDS, and they'd basically be helping that person with AIDS 
to the end of life. So it was really kind of a hospice care kind of thing. So that was in 1987. It was totally a volunteer organization. Like a lot of these organizations are all volunteers. Um, they're still going on today. They um, had an office in downtown above the health food store from about 1990 to about 93 or 94. And then they moved to City Hall. They have an office up where City Hall is. A um, couple of the things that we have from them is some t-shirts from their AIDS walk. Um, we did that, we showed that when we had to survive a plague here at the library uh, a few years ago. Um, and we are gonna be working with them to get all of their archives um, preserved at the Portland Athenaeum. Um, in 1995, so AIDS Response Seacoast was a New Hampshire-based, Portsmouth-based organization. So any monies that they got had to be used for New Hampshire men or women or anyone with AIDS in, in, in New Hampshire Seacoast. In 1995, a group of gay men thought that they really wanted to do prevention education regardless of the border. So we're, what, half a mile from Maine and about 20 minutes from Massachusetts. So a lot of people from Maine and Massachusetts would come here, go to the bars here when there were bars. So they wanted to do prevention education regardless of the borders, you know, so they wanted to bring men together, teach them safe sex practices, regardless of where they were. So their, their slogan was prevention without borders. And they were founded in 1995 and they, um, disbanded in 2017. So again, we were around, so they said, do you want our stuff? So one of our members went through all of their stuff and took out anything that was a personal information. So people that participated in the workshops, anything like that was removed, but we have all their financial records, all the meeting minutes, all of their um, program materials. So anything that they want to hand it out to participants or any posters they used, we have all of those and those will be available at, at the FNM once we get it all cataloged. So with the AIDS group, I kind of went from 87, the AIDS response started and in 1995, I kept those two groups kind of together because they were dealing with AIDS. Um, the next group that we know about was Out and About. This was a women's group started in 1990. And in Portsmouth, there was a place called The Safe Place. And they had a workshop for lesbian women in the early 1990s. And about five of them thought, well, let's, have a, let's start our own group. Let's start a social group. And so they started Out and About. And that went from 1990 to 2000. Um, this is a picture from uh, the March on Washington in 1993. We have that banner. Um, they gave that banner to us. We have their posters. We have some of their posters. We have some of their newsletters. We have t-shirts and hats that they have donated to us. Um, there's a couple banners actually that we have. One of them was homemade by somebody, but this one was actually homemade as well. So that's some of the things that we have from that organization in our collection. Um, the next organization, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. This was, um, They've kept the moniker P flag, but it was now more inclusive. But I just kept the old name, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, because that's how it started. The first um, P flag in New Hampshire was in 1986 in Concord, New Hampshire. And there was a number of people from the seacoast that were going to Concord all the time for these meetings. And they said, well, why don't we start our own chapter? So they started, they formed the he flagged New Hampshire Seacoast chapter in 1991. Um, and they have donated to us, somebody in that organization put together a um, 
scrapbook. So I, uh, the top photo is a scrapbook that they put together, which shows the whole growth of their organization from some newspaper articles from the early 90s, where the parents were talking about their children, to the posters that they created recruiting parents to come. Um, so we have that whole collection from P flag. They're still going on today. Um, one of the things that they did was in 1993, they did the Respect for All Youth. Um, what's the right word for that? Uh, not symposium. <laughs> what word am I thinking of? Conference, thank you. <laughs> Respect for All Youth Conference at the MUB Memorial Union Building at UNH. And this was in March of 1993. And they brought together people from across the country that were very active in the, the gay rights movement, especially around children. So people like uh, Virginia Uribe from Los Angeles, who was working on a Project 10 project in the LA school system. Warren, Warren Blumenfeld, who wrote books on LGBTQ people and youth. So it was quite a huge conference. And the thing that I really loved about it was I volunteered that day there and I saw my children's pediatrician was there and their school principal was there. And I said, okay, kids are gonna be okay. <laughs> um, at the end of that conference, you know, people were like, well, what can we do? What should we do? And um, they suggested they start a Seacoast Outright group. So <laughs> here we go. That was the next group that was formed, or one of the next groups that was formed in the Seacoast. Um, and when you, it's interesting, you'll hear a lot of, about South Church, the UU Church enforcement. Part of their mission early on was to be supportive of LGBTQ people, which is why they had Seacoast Men meeting there, which is why I had the Gay AA meeting there. When people approached them from to form a Seacoast Outright group, they let them meet in the church to form the organization. So in the summer of 1993, people were meeting at the church, deciding how to create this Seacoast Outright group. And there were two schools of thought. One was like, let's just open the door and invite people in and see what happens. And the other school of thought was, let's get our policies and procedures in place. Let's make sure we're doing background checks. Let's train people on how to deal with youth in crisis, perhaps. So um, that group went out and <laughs> they opened their doors in September of 1993. At the University, Unitarian Universalist Church again in the building behind the church with the church owned at the time. And everyone that said, oh, your first meeting, you'd be lucky if you get anybody. And their first meeting, they had about eight or 10 kids. So that's still going on today. Um, in 2015, as part of a fundraising effort, they started the first annual Portsmouth Pride. Um, and that is continuing um, each June, we put on Portsmouth Pride. And this was a newsletter from 1994, Happy Birthday was their first anniversary. And like a lot of these organizations, this started as an all volunteer organization. There was no paid staff. It grew so much that they now have paid staff and second director and outreach people and all that. Um, but initially it was just all volunteer. Oh, I'm gonna go back to that one. Um, we just received all of their archives. So um, all of their newsletters, all their meeting minutes, photographs, all photo albums, all kinds of wonderful stuff um, for, our, for our archives. So they're, and since they're continuing on, they'll be giving us stuff every year that will incorporate into everything that we already have. Another group that started in 1993, was the Dover Gay Lesbian Bisexual and Transgender Group. This was started by Rick Tate in 1993 in Dover. They met at their friend's Quaker meeting house on Central Avenue. Um, Jasper Salah joined in quickly after that. Um, and they were very conscious of wanting to include everybody. 
They knew there was a women's group out and about. They knew that there was a men's group. Seacoast came in, but they wanted to be inclusive and try to bring everybody together. So they were gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and transgender. Um, that was the first time that uh, any group used transgender or transgendered in their um, moniker or their um, initials. Um, and they were very much of a social group. They started out very much of a, just a social group and they were doing all kinds of things like sleigh rides and you know pizza nights and all kinds of things. Um, and they actually became quite a support group. They actually had a um, helpline that you could call. Um, they were around until 2003. So they were around for about 10 years. We have all of their archives. So we have all of their posters, all of their meeting minutes, all of the times that they were in the Foster's Daily Democrat, the newspaper, um, which is great. It's boxes and boxes of material. And then we have that banner, which they, I think they used um, at the New Hampshire Pride. The Gender Sexuality Alliance initially was the um, gay student, um, gay, sorry, gay straight alliance at Portland High School. It started in the late 90s. And um, like a lot of groups, support groups or social groups started very informally. Um, the principal at the time and the guidance counselor just kind of said, hey, you know, if you want to come to some kind of meeting or you want to sit around and talk about being gay or lesbian, come to our come to this room after school on Friday or whatever. Um, it has since grown and it's changed its name. Now it is called the Gender Sexuality Alliance. And these are just some, you can see um, an older yearbook photo where it was called the Gay Straight Transgender Alliance. And now it's just called the Gender Sexuality Alliance. They're still meeting. Um, and actually there is a GSA at the Portsmouth Biddle School. So right next door here, there's one, and Little Harbor School also has GSA. Women Singing Out, um, this was an offshoot of Women in Harmony in Portland, Maine. So there was a number of women from New Hampshire that were going to Portland and singing in this women's group. And there, a lot of them identified as lesbians and they're like, we want to, you know, say that. We want to be open about that we're lesbians and um, the group in May, of Portland, Maine didn't want that. So they split off and formed Women Singing Out in 1999. Um, they perform concerts in Portsmouth all, every year. Um, for all those years they were around. Um, and again, since we were around when they disbanded in 2018, we have all of their stuff. Um, so we have um, all of their financial records, all of their um, posters. We have all of their programs, all of the postcards that they mailed out to people. We have copies of everything that they ever had. and. Um, you have all their CDs. <laughs> um, so it's a great, great collection. It's unfortunate that they, that they disbanded. And with a lot of these groups, the, the interest just waned. You know, people were, you know, weren't recruiting enough people to, to participate. So that's um, the social and support groups. And I, I don't really necessarily distinguish between the two in the sense that when people get together socially, they get a lot of support from each other. So um, I do think that if you're counting yourself as a support group, I think you should be a little more able to handle crisis situations and things. But if you're a social group, hey, you're just getting together and fun. Um, now I wanted to go on to the club and bar scene. And the Seaport Club was the first club that we could find in Portsmouth, in the seacoast of New Hampshire. I have no idea if there's other clubs in other cities in New Hampshire that might have been before the Seaport Club. But the Seaport Club was incorporated in 1956. It was incorporated 
um, and it did business as before, uh, it did business as the Acropolis Greek Club. So the way it was explained to us by the person who eventually bought the Seaport Club from previous owners was that in the 50s, and even before that, there was all these social groups. So the liquor license process in New Hampshire is if you're not serving food, you can't, you can't serve liquor. If you're serving liquor and not food, you have to be a private club. Uh, and so there were a lot of private clubs, you know, the Italian American club, the VFW, the, you know, all these clubs, the Sagamore Republican Club, the Night Owl Club. All these clubs were around on the seacoast. And in 1956, the Acropolis Greek Club, which had been around for years, incorporated as a seaport club. And they started meeting here where the press room is in Portsmouth on the second floor. Actually, they had the second and third floor. The third floor was the dance floor. The, uh, the second floor was the bar area. And because all these clubs were, they were losing members, you know, and, and in order to keep your club going, you have to have members to pay for the rent, to pay for the bartender, to pay for booze, whatnot. So in somewhere in the 50s, between 1956 and 1959, they invited the gays to open a club and the gays opened a club called the Sagamore Club. So somewhere around 19, we know in 1959, the Sagamore Club was here by looking at the city directories. It's not listed before that. City directories aren't always accurate. It's people going door to door, you know, saying, hey, what clubs are here? But so we know definitely in 1959, the Sagamore Club was a gay club meeting at this location. And it met there until 1976. Now, some of the stories you hear, first of all, you see the, the guy in, um, by the car in front of that door. That's the in, that was the entrance to the club. So you walked up there, there was some stairs up. There was a door at the top of the stairs. You had to knock on the door. They'd look for the people and let you in if you weren't, you know, somebody they didn't want. Um, and uh, now, since it's all been remodeled, the stairs are all inside the press room. There's no longer, that's, the buildings aren't connected on the second and third floor anymore. Um, and when we were talking about this club, there was a lot of men that came up to us and said, I remember the Seaport Club being on Lafayette Road. I remember going by in the school bus and seeing and people saying that's the gay club. And, but nobody could really give us any evidence. We finally found in the city directories that in 1972 and 1973, the Sagamore Club was listed as being at three, 241 Lafayette Road, which is where Gito Subs is now. It's in front of Tire Warehouse. It's down on Route 1. I don't have a picture of that. Um, one of the things that's difficult about researching in city directories is a lot of times that the, the addresses change. The post office will every once in a while go through and say, we're renumbering everything. So where 3241 was in the 70s, it's probably not where 3241 is now. Um, I have no idea why it's listed both in um, Lafayette Road and still downtown at where the press room is. Again, it's a city directory, people going out seeing what's where. Um, but so the Seaport Club started in 1956 doing business as the Acropolis Creek Club. They invited the gays, and we know that by 1959, we can see the Sagamore Club was here. And it was there until 1976. So again, just going through the, the city directories, you can see it's still listed as there. The building was sold in 1976 to Jay Smith, and that's when the press room opened, 76, 77. In 76, the Seaport Club moved to 400 Route 1 bypass south. So this Usually, where the U-Haul is on Route One South, where um, the West End Yards are now. So this building was where the Seaport Club was. 
It was just the square part of the building. That front section wasn't there at the time. Um, and again, it was a just a nondescript door that you went and knocked on and it let you in. You had to be a member. If you weren't a member, you could become a member right away. Sign up that way. It was there from 1976 to 1986. And it did business as a seaport club. So it kind of, that's the other thing that's um, hard to keep track of because some people call it the Sagamore Club and some people call it the Seaport Club. The way we try to distinguish it is that it was a Sagamore Club when it was downtown. It was a Seaport Club when it wasn't downtown. Um, and in 1986, they moved to um, Green Street. This would be by the Portsmouth Sheridan. This is behind the Sheridan, there's a little short warehouse building. Was it a dojo for a while after? Was it a dojo? Was it a dojo place for <laughs> afterwards? Yeah, like right after I honestly like a year or so from the dojo was and that whole and that somewhere in that warehouse strip and stuff, yeah. And again, it was a very just you know, there was just a 55 on the door. So you just knocked and they let you in. Um so some of the things we have for members is we have a lot for members. The owner of the members, so sorry, it still was the Seaport Club Incorporated. They started calling themselves members when they moved to Green Street. So there's still, it goes back to that original license or incorporation in 1956. Um, but they started calling by members and we were fortunate that um, Dick Lishman, who started members, is still around. And he started mailing us things like the t-shirt, which was a staff t-shirt. Um, we got membership cards from somebody that was local and donated the membership cards. The manager of members from 1986 to 1996 is still around in the area, Joe Est. And he donated a ton of material to us. A lot of photographs from inside the bar when they were doing Halloween or there's a marriage that took place there. And we have a lot of newspaper clippings that he kept whenever members was mentioned in the newspapers. So we have a great, great collection of members memorabilia. Like we have match books, we have all kinds of things. Uh, we would love to have that for the women's clubs, but we're not getting as much as we'd like. Um, members was here until 1996. They lost their lease. Um, they looked for another place to open and they couldn't find anything that fit their needs. So they closed their doors in 1996. A year later, the owner of the property came back to Dick and Joe and said, would you reopen? Can you reopen? We haven't found anyone to rent the space. But in the meantime, they had tore everything out. So all the bathrooms were gone, all the, the second floor was gone, the dance floor was gone, everything was gone. So they're like, we can't afford to put all kinds of money back into it, um, just open up the, the club again. So they'd never reopen. Now the women's club. So I just, I kind of went through the, the men's club started in the late fifties, last until the mid nineties. For the women's club, um, this is 40 Pleasant Street where Five High Bistro is. Um, in 1980, uh, Mercy Chick and Randon Eddie wanted to open a women's bar, women's club in Portsmouth. So they came to this building, which was a Napa auto parts store at the time. And they went around the back, down the stairs, into the basement. And in the basement were all these mufflers hanging and they walked through the basement and they said, we can make this work. We can make a women's club here. So they did. They opened in 1980. They opened on uh, New Year's Eve. They didn't have a liquor license right away. They didn't takes time to get a liquor license and they didn't have one. Um, but they opened anyway. And the first night they had 75 women show up. And so they 
um, their club was downstairs. The dance floor and the bar was downstairs. They became very, so popular that they started renting the floor now where Five Tie is, the, the restaurant is. And they set up, you know, um, couches and things just for a hangout for women. They started serving some food. Um, so it was very, very popular. Um, and that lasted for about seven years. Um, one of the things um, we've discovered since starting this project is that they actually had a newsletter. We actually had one uh, over on the table if you're interested in looking at it from 1984. And it's just fascinating to see, you know, what ads were happening. Who was, um, who was performing here? There were some pretty big names that came here. Kate Clinton comes to mind, who became a very popular, very important lesbian comedian. And she performed here, right here in Portsmouth. Um, one of the things that you should look at when next time you're downtown. So when they decided to open the bar downtown, up downstairs in the basement, one of the things the city said was you need to have a second egress. So there was a door in the back. And so if you go and you, if the next time you're walking by, look at this grate here in front of the building. And if you look down in the grate, you'll see there's this nice 1980s storm door and some steps coming up. Um, and that was their second method of egress at the time. So it's still there. I mean, it's under a grate you now. You can't get to it. Um, if the grate wasn't there at the time, it was a um, kind of a railing um, around two thirds of it. So that was the form of egress. Um, now, when Iris um, said they were going to close, there was a few women that said, "We're going to open up another club," and, and they opened up Cats. Um, in 1986, and it was in Northampton. It's not a very good picture. It was on 861 off Lafayette Road. Um, and that survived since 1993. We have absolutely nothing from this club. We don't have any, we have one photo from a newspaper that shows a couple women at cats. We don't have, anything else and we would love to get some things if anyone knows anybody that has cats memorabilia that would be great um so this was so getting back to a little bit more about liquor license and things cats was incorporated as city unlimited and they did business as cats so there was a liquor license called city unlimited um, and that liquor license followed cats when they moved to 948 Route 1 bypass in Portsmouth. So this is over um, right as the turn as you're going on to off of Route 1 bypass coming into Portsmouth. There is a, I think a spa there now, Ash something. Um, it was a ballroom for a while. So did everyone see where that, get an idea of where that was or is? Um, so they moved there in 1994 and started doing business as Desert Hearts. Um, and if you drove by, there was this awesome mural in the window. It was like a big sheet of plywood that somebody had painted a woman on a motorcycle and the sun set and it's a Desert Hearts. We'd love to get that if anyone knows where that is. So um, oh yeah, this was um, the Women's Club from 1994 to 2002. And then in 2002, it started doing business as Club One North. And that lasted until 2010. So getting back to the men's club, it closed in 1996. The men started going here to Desert Hearts and basically took it over. And we need to club one north. <laughs> so um, it's just the way it was, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but it's unfortunate they lost their lease in 2010 and couldn't find a space to go to move to. So that was the end of the bars and club scene in Portsmouth and the seacoast. There are still some clubs in New Hampshire, but they're up in Manchester. And there's, I think, a couple of clubs still left in Comfort. And maybe there's still a couple left in Boston, but they're really all closing down, unfortunately. Um, that's um, kind of covers all the social and support groups on the seacoast. 
one of the things I wanted to kind of talk about was when we were researching all this and looking into this, we really could see that there was a surge of stuff in the 70s. So after Stonewall, when the gay student organization at UNH started, there was a bunch of things happening. There was the Seacoast Area Gay Alliance. It was that women's, lesbian women's were, no, it wasn't lesbian, it was gay women's rap group back in the 70s. And then it was very quiet, you know, like SGM started in the 70s, the KAA early 80s. And they got very quiet. And the things, the only thing that happened in the 80s was really around AIDS. And then in the 90s, it was another explosion of things, you know, the, the outright happened, the PFLAG happened, the uh, out and about. Uh, a lot of that stuff came about in the 90s. And some of that really had to do with Bill Clinton becoming president in 1993 or being elected in 92. It was a march on Washington in 1993. That was the last time the LGBT community marched on Washington. And um, so that was a big impetus that brought people together and it said, let's, let's do something. Let's, you know. Um, so we saw a big explosion in, in the 90s of LGBTQ social and support groups. Um, and then in the 2000s, 2000s century, you see all this decline, like they all went away, <laughs> except, uh, you know, there's still P flag and outright and all that. And SGM still going, but a lot of them just ended. Again, it, some of it was the whole internet, influence of the internet. People aren't coming together as much anymore. Um, some of it was that people lost interest. I'm just saying, like when they're singing out, they just couldn't recruit enough singers anymore. So um, that's one of the things we kind of observed was that there's just like a lot of stuff in the 70s, very right little in the 80s, and then again in the 90s, and not much uh, since. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was what our group, the Seacoast LGBT History Project has available to loan to churches, synagogues, libraries, anything is um, we have these panels. I brought one in, social life and safe space panel. We have six panels that talk about the stories of the Seacoast in different categories. Um, all to the color of the rainbow flag. So we have um, red was arts and culture, which you don't see in the pictures. Um, orange was health. So we have a whole panel that talks about the, the Seacoast response to AIDS, um, the feminist health centers in there. Um, yellow was um, activism and politics. And that, um, Includes all kinds of um, political groups and things like that. What comes after yellow green was commerce. So that talked about all about the restaurants and, and other kinds of things that was happening in the seacoast. Um, what's after green and blue? It was the social groups and safe spaces. So it talks about SGM, it talks about um, a bunch of different people that were very active in that area. Um, Violet was um, religion. So it talks about um, churches becoming open and affirming or whatever the term they use for welcoming LGBTQ people. And I think that was it. Six, so we have those six of these panels that we can lend out to um, different organizations if they want to use them. And then one of the things we realized when we were doing this project was there was a lot of not misinformation, just people just didn't know the general LGBTQ history. Like what, when was Stonewall? What was Stonewall? So um, one of the members of our, our committee decided to put together some posters that explained what these things were. So on the bottom slide on the left, it, uh, the posters that he put together for us. So now, very gratefully, he we did all the research, did all the writing, did all the buying of the rights to whatever photographs he wanted to use and paid for all the printing and the framing and everything else. So now we have those to lend out. So we have one on just the Stonewall riots and what they were, and then the rest of them talk about the gay social movements in the United States. So we're trying to give 
whenever we set up an exhibit, we like to include those to try to say, this is what was going on in the rest of the United States. This is what was going on in Fort Smith. Uh, so we have those to lend out. Um, so I want to just talk more about our project uh, and where we're at and what we're doing. There's one, before I do that, there was one group I didn't really talk about. We have very little information about it. And the weird thing is that I was involved in it. Um, and it's strange how quickly you forget. But in 1995, we formed a group called the Rainbow Network. It was, the intention was to kind of bring all these groups together out and about SGM, PFLAG, you know, Seacoast Outright, you know, do we need a community center? Do we want a community center? Or would, you know, where, where would it be? What would it be about? It was trying to be a, 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 an umbrella organization that would help all these other organizations and connect them all. Um, we had a Halloween dance and raised some money. And then we disbanded in about a year. Um, and again, it was a time when AOL started coming online and we were all volunteers and life happened and people moved. And um, so that group didn't last very long, but it had, it was an interesting to have a mission to try to get a community center. Um, it would have been interesting to actually start one at the time. Anyway, on our project, um, Part of our project is we're doing an oral history project. So we have um, a professor from UNH that is doing oral histories for us. We have about 13 of them now done and transcribed and everything that needs to be done for those. Um, we have a walking tour. So through the Portsmouth Historical Society, you can sign up for Gay Old Times walking tour where we walk by where Iris was and actually look at the door down there. <laughs> under the greats. Um, and that's uh, next year, it will be the second Sundays of the month from May to October. And then we're gonna do a bunch more in June for Pride Month. Um, our audio video archive. So I told you that P Flag put together this great photo album for us or you know scrapbook for us, um, which has their, uh, their whole history. We also got from them hundreds and hundreds of videos that they had in their lending library. So think about the early 90s when PFLAG started here on the Seacoast, a lot of libraries didn't have gay, lesbian movies. And so PFLAG took it upon themselves to gather these movies and lend them out to people. Um, they also recorded a number of TV specials on LGBTQ people and um, they recorded some of their own workshops that they did. So we received all of those video archives. We have other people donating other video things as well. So we have all of that. Um, all of the, our audio and video archives are gonna be here at the Public Ports of the Public Library. That's where they are now. And um, I gotta tell you, Ports of the Public Library is one of the greatest assets in this city. Um, when we first started our group in 2015, we started meeting here and it was great because they would advertise for us. You know, we come in, in the room and they would put, uh, put us on the calendar. So that's how people got to know partly that we were around. Um, and they agreed to hold all of our audio and video archives. And um, they're so gracious with their space. I still have some upstairs that I need to pick up. <laughs> so they've been really great about working with some of our interns on getting the audio and video archives all cataloged, all um, indexed or whatever it is they, they do so that it's easily, easily searchable. So we have all our audio and video archives here. All of our oral histories are going to be here and it'll be available to the public next year. A year from now, we'll be doing a presentation about here's all of the oral histories we have. Here's how you access it. Here's some of the um, video and audio archives that we have, and here's how you access them. Um, some of the video and audio archives will just be for research only. We can't really make them available to the public because they were copied off of TV shows or something, you know, some 60 minutes segment and all that. But they're interesting to watch just as, um, for history purposes. Uh, this Sunday, we're doing a rainbow symposium. We were doing this annually. Um, we didn't for the last two years with the pandemic, but um, they're doing one this Sunday. 
on transgender and non-binary people. That's at the Portsmouth Historical Society, <clears throat> excuse me, Discover Center downtown, the old library, as everyone calls it. And that's going to be from two to four. And we're going to have, um, we're hoping to have a panel. If not, we at least have one person speaking about their experience. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the local celebrities too. I call them celebrities. <laughs> um, throughout history, transgender and non-binary people that have made the news in Portsmouth in the Sea Coast. So we'll be talking about that. Um, we're going to be doing it, and we're hoping to bring that back again as a yearly event, the third Sunday in October is kind of what we've set for that. Um, in terms of all the stuff that's been donated to us, like so all the women singing out stuff, the uh, Seacoast Gay Men stuff, all of that's housed at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. And we've been working with UNH interns over the past couple of semesters to get it all cataloged um, and organized. So the first thing we did was we met with the archivist at the Portsmouth Athenaeum and she helped us kind of catalog our stuff kind of like how do we chunk this all up and it's very much women singing out it's going to be their own group you know sequels came in there's a couple archives that we got from individual people that were very specific to this person and those will be kept together so for example i don't know if people remember melissa weeks but she was a seacoast artist very active in the lgbt community did a lot on gay marriage etc we received her archives from her partner, surviving partner, and it was a scrapbook put together by the surviving partner. So that's going to stay together as kind of her story, her archives, even though some of the material you know, we'll have in other folders, it just tells her story. So we want to keep that. And there's a few of those that we'll keep as individual stories. Uh, but most of it will be broken out into groups. And the process is um, to kind of just so you know, when I started this, if I knew how long it would take to catalog everything and the work that happened once you collect it, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I would have said too much work, um, but it's so important to keep it and maintain it. So the, one of the first things you do is just sort everything. Okay, here's all the SGM stuff. Here's all the missing you know, stuff. Here's all stuff on P5. Here's all stuff on ARS. And then you go through and you say, take out all the duplicates and say, okay, we don't need to save, you know, six copies of, you know, SGMs Incorporation. You know, we don't need to have, you know, seven copies of Pete Legg's poster. Um, and then we say, okay, now we take out all that. Now we go through and we take any newspaper article and we make a copy of it and we you know, recycle the newspaper article. Since newspaper doesn't last as well as copy so then we do that and then the next step is to kind of take that folder of stuff let's say it's um women singing out and then we just got to make a catalog listing of everything so there's two parts to that one is just really um a detailed description of everything so it's a huge excel spreadsheet with all these columns like what is this and then from that we narrow it down to just put a listing in the folder so for example, um, for women singing out, we will have, you know, there's newsletters from 1980, 1999 to 2018. You know, the next set is financial records from this state to this state. So there'll be a listing and all those listings will be available online. So you can kind of go, you know, I'm curious in what women singing out has. And I can go online at the course of that same site. So oh, there's a folder. It's online, and then you can come in and you can ask to blow that stuff or look at that stuff there at the Athenaeum. The ultimate goal is to have as much stuff online as possible. So, for example, um, Seacoast Game Ed, somebody in 2010 scanned over 10,000 documents for SGM. It's huge. It's um, so all of their newsletters from the early uh, 79 on up to 2010, somebody scanned in. So we have all of those already online. They're not available to the public yet because we got to go through and 
index them. You have to put keyword searches and all this stuff on there so that when you go there and you say, oh, I'm interested in the cruise that SGM used to do, you can search for cruise and you'll see all the newsletters that talked about the cruise. So um, eventually we want to get a lot of that stuff on digital. So SGM is going to be the first one because most of it's already done. And some of it we probably never will put on digital just because it, the, the use would probably be so low. Um, for example, I came in fight AIDS, they received a lot of things from the state about uh, you know, educational practices, you know, information about AIDS. And so a lot of that we might not ever put online, but it will be available um, at the afternoon. And I think that, oh, um, I just wanted to end with, I kind of like this quote, a people cannot exist as a people without a history. Um, this was, um, let me put my updated version. <laughs> In 1973, this is a quote from um, Rod Wagoner. He lost his boyfriend in the upstairs lounge fire in New Orleans in 1973. And he said this because nobody cared about these people. I, they, I think it was recently in the news because they're finally identifying some of the bodies that they didn't identify back in the 70s. So again, thinking in the 70s, um, everything was behind closed doors. People, parents didn't know. So if somebody was in New Orleans, at this club upstairs lounge and they burned, you know, there was nothing to identify them and parents didn't necessarily say they were missing, they didn't know, you know, the person just ran away or whatever. So there was a number of bodies that were never identified. And it's recently been in the news because they're going back to try to identify the remains of some people. And it's one of the things I wanted to quickly mention too is that our language keeps changing when it comes around in terms of LGBTQ people. Um, for example, if you notice in the 70s, it was gay. Gay was the word, and it was a gay woman's rap group, you know, and then it was um, transgendered was used for a while, and then it was transgender. You know? So it's just it's another observation that we make that as time passed, the, the names and the way we talked about each other and just trying to be more inclusive changed. And they're going to continue to change. And if you come on Sunday, we're going to learn a lot of new terms for people and um, sexuality and gender and all that stuff. So that's, that's a lot of dates and times and things. And um, there's a lot of archive stuff. And I think some of the greatest stuff is just the stories that people tell. And so in the oral history that are available, that will be so fun to listen to. Um, so that's it. So if anyone has any questions or observations, and there is, um, I brought a number of pieces of artifacts. So all that stuff on the table, those are duplicate things. So. They're not going to go back to the Athenaeum. They're uh, available to display. So if you have time, to take a look at Glenn. Uh, I have a quick question for Martin. So there's been, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a new social group for um, lesbians of Les A. Um, that mm. just um, uh, popped up in the last year or so. Um, that seems that only a continuation of what happened previously. Um, just a modern, um, yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that because I just heard about it a yeah. couple weeks ago and it's it's very it's all virtual. Yeah. Which, yeah. which I was like, hmm, it's so virtually, but it's the way in the world. So um that's a great point. There are social groups starting again, and I think it's you know, this hybrid model of kind of being online and a way to connect with people. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what the next social group stuff brings. Is that rainbow? Yeah. Um, yeah. Rainbow, 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 was it called the Rainbow Network? Yes. I remember. Yes. 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 Yes.
I know, time, time goes by very fast. It was in 1995, right? When we had the first meeting at the Seacoast Rep donated their space. And at the end of it, we had all this rainbow, what would you call it? Uh, not confetti. No, the um, streamer. streamer is, is, yeah. Crepe paper, that's the word I was looking for. Um, streamers. And so everyone in the audience got like a roll of streamers and then they were just supposed to throw it, hold on to the end and throw it, kind of make this, web of all these people and it was supposed to be the rainbow network because it was rainbow color and it was very we had a lot of fun again like we have so little i think actually i, I take that back i have a copy of our bylaws <laughs> unsigned but it's a copy of what our bylaws were um, and then i think there's an article that we have and that's about it Unfortunate, you know, you don't think at the time to necessarily save everything. Any other questions or observations? Anyone here go to Iris or have any um, memorabilia from Iris or cats or desert hearts? I kind of went to desert hearts early on. Uh, there really isn't much to do socially anymore. Yeah. And I could be the lonely period that I'm Manchester. Uh, I did a lot of Boston stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm talking uh, probably mid 90s to. Uh, and and people I meet, there's some I wonder where did all go? Yeah, right, right, right. And why? Yeah. And why? It's still stuff like you can do there are dances there are one woman throws the uh, house. But those things should be Yeah. Lots. Yeah. Used to be a lot of fun. And I always, you know, when people ask me like what's the gay community like in Portsmouth now, I go. Hmm. You know, if you asked me in 1995, I would have said, well, oh, it's great. You know, we have this club and that club. We have this women's group. We have that men's group. We have this. You know, we have a group that goes to the UU church. We have, the, you know, Bob Stiefel's church down there on Route 1. You know, you, you could connect, you know, with people. And now it's kind of like, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Arkansas, of all places. <laughs> right, and, and in some ways, you know, it's, it's bringing people like that together. You can chat with somebody in Arkansas and say, hey, how are things there? How are things here? And compare oh, yeah. What were you going to say, Michael, you missed the clubs? Or some clubs? <laughs> but speaking to like she was saying that, Lots of lots of people and not kind of like a hair down and not like bonkers. So maybe going in Boston is kind of a little bit more intriguing because you can feel like that. Run into someone that you can say, like, not all that run into. Right, right. Coming or going. So lots of people, you know, and there's more in Boston. Was a big thing, yeah. And there's so many clubs, so many, and now there's not a panic. Same thing with I that I got put on that building. I I pretty much just living and working there. I was here from the mid 90s and on job to work in the playhouse and all of that. I mean, to stay at the end of the old ends. And now it's like I have to go down to the beach on season one, two, four years. There's like Sense it doesn't feel as much, it doesn't feel as gay as it used to. And I think some people aren't even saying that. Uh, yeah. Who are to do that? Because they're going to ask, well, you know, they're going there either to dance and just hang out with friends. You don't 
beat people in a bar the way you used to. Right, 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 right. Well, now, now if you go to Ogunga Beach, everyone's on their phone, right? They're not even talking to the people that's sitting next to them, right? You know, so, yeah. Um, and I know in P Town, I think they're um, they were worried about that, especially during the pandemic. You know, like if the gay people are coming here because of the pandemic, how do we keep them coming back? The fortunate thing, according to Dave Blando, that happened was the number of gay people moved into P town. So they had like an increase of about 800 people. For a town that's that small, that's pretty big. And so they're they're hoping that that will keep that will stay, you know, as people work from home and could live in P town, that's where they chose to live. So hopefully um, but I think it's other factors uh the inns were selling in terms of condos so it's more expensive. So it's not like a lot of 20 year olds can afford $85 a night to stay in an up end resort, either they're going to have to crash people or they take day trips. That was there for carnival this year. I went back to my room right before carnival camp just because it was getting so hot. I walked out at 6 30 at night. I could walk into any restaurant and walk in there. As soon as the was over, it was gone. Like, mm -hmm. I could not believe that that was one of the disposable of the busiest nights of the year. And by 6 30, people were either in their rooms or they left. Mm -hmm. I can go to the seat in the restaurant. Nobody ever been shocked. Um, you know, it's like it's, it's definitely a good vibe. It's still okay. It's just not, I don't feel social, inclusive, and carefree. It seems like it's a lot more subdued, um, family friendly. Like these type of events, like the best in Austin. They would have a, a model under like model of underwear and the proceeds would go to like that or something like that. And or they even had a fun bin where we go to different resorts and we got free drinks and have to be, you know, with the tall one of the business owners. They will limit all that. Everything is just a go to a bar and I dance in the cost. And you know, and everyone can be friends. <laughs> On their phones. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, we're gonna check my phone. Um yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And one of the things that um, when we were, why we created these panels as in categories was because we couldn't, we didn't want to do a timeline and we didn't, timelines imply beginnings and ends. And um, for example, we know, I'm sure some of the Abenaki people that were here were LGBTQ people. Um, but the Abenaki people are still here, you know? So it's not like you can say, oh, back then there were these, you know, they're still here. So um, that's why we created categories and tried to tell our story that way and not chronologically, because we keep making history. Yeah, and also the notion of like talking about things like, and they did this for it was a day, so day was created. Acting up for a little revolution, and then like what a period and stuff like that. And I'm not feeling like all the things are done. Gay women were created in, in the last like four hours, and gay women were created in the last hundred years. So, or even before that, it doesn't, the, since the definition of gay is so hard, you know, that you then, like, you wouldn't say the Greeks were gay, they were not gay. Gay didn't exist. Right, 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 yeah. right, exactly. And, you know, a lot of the trying to look back to, for example, Beauport Mansion in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which everybody knows was owned by a gay guy, and, but he never spoke, explicitly came out and said that. He never, you know, so it's, you tell his story by implying and reading his letters and, and you know, saying, this is what he talked about, about his friend. This is how he talked about him. And, you know, right, that word wasn't there. You know, they were just, Two men that loved each other, you know. What I mean, so it's it's yeah, it's hard to go back. We would love to find a, an old diary or something important from somebody that was talking about. I mean, if you think about it, it's a sailor's town, right? And it, when peas moved in in the fifties, I mean, just think of all the men that were here in this town, from the shipyard to the air force, put them together, um, something's going to happen. I'm generally shocked they don't have it in a bar on the piece. I agree with all that. 
There was something that we told them about I, can't, I don't remember it, but they used to come into Portsmouth for the bars. There's a somewhat more vibrant community in Florida. I do have the good fortune to live in Florida. Nice. People about six to six. And in Gulfport, uh, I think some of you have heard of Gulfport, the same key area. Yeah. Uh, we have some things going uh, You know, I can't say what it's like it was 20 years ago here. Yeah. But yeah, when I go back down, it's, it's more to do. You know, we have dances that we don't purchase too much. Yeah. yeah, it's probably like Walt Manners for which is very gay men centric, and there are a bunch of clubs there still. So you know, it's it's all of us guys that remember the clubs and are retiring down there that still want to have the club experience. So that's part of it. There is a Stonewall National Archives and Museum is in Fort Lauderdale slash Walt Manners. And we've been in touch with them. We've sent them some extra stuff that we have. So um, some of our Seacoast history stuff will end up down in their archives as well. Um, and that has been a good thing about this project as well. You'd be amazed at how many archivable LGBTQ projects there are across the country. Um, we've had a number of interns attending some of the online presentations, some of the library staff here. Um, joining in on some of those conference calls talking about LGBTQ archives. It would be nice that someday uh, we all be connected. If you do get a chance, go to the University of Southern Maine, look up the LGBTQ archives. Tons of stuff. It's really fascinating to look back. <laughs>